Back in the 18th century, a German physicist named Ernest Cladney, who was, by the way, often referred to as the father of acoustics, he studied how sound affected matter, and he did this in a very interesting way. He spread a coat of light sand on steel discs, and he noticed that when a violin bow was used across the side of the disc, it produced a certain note, and it caused the discs with the sand on the top of them to vibrate and form geometrical shapes. And this was also studied by other researchers and they discovered the same thing using also liquids and metals and powders. Now from a musician's standpoint this is kind of interesting because it teaches us that the more balance that we can learn to add to our study of both melody and sound the better the geometry that we can produce with the sound waves. So in this episode of the Guitar Blog Insider I'm going to discuss ways to practice and study music that focus on the value of producing balanced melody. Now, if you're going to start working on ways to maintain more balance across a melody line, one of the important principles that you need to focus on is learning to compose passages that have a serious flow to them with very connected melodic impressions along the way. And one of the music styles that achieves this uh, very well, of course, is classical music. So by spending some time working at composing stuff that sounds like classical music, those types of melodies, you're going to tap into this strict impression of melodic flow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with playing you an example of doing some work like this, some classical sounding melody. example that I just played there, you know, has a strong connection to how one melodic idea flows smoothly into the next. Its, uh, its flow is so well connected that the music listener can start anticipating what that next musical statement will be, and then the line will end up arriving in that general direction. The, the result for the listener is it gives that impression almost of, you know, they can sense and understand where the melodic line is taking them, and then when it makes the arrival there, they feel satisfied, you know, that they anticipated where that sound was moving toward. Now, the other cool thing that happens is at the end of a phrase that we have in this style of music, uh, the melodic contour will generally move through into a very strong resolution point that helps the listener connect strongly with a feeling of completion, with a, a solid ending. Now, these ideas are absolutely fantastic to study on your instrument, and when you learn to produce them, all of your other melodic ideas that you're working on in your playing will slowly become stronger and much more connected. Now, especially this feeds over to when you're doing improvisation. So let's take this idea a little bit further along here with another melody line and we'll try and expand on some of these principles. <laughs> example, once again, open with a very connected, very impressionable, recurring melodic theme. However, the latter half of the melody shifted to the use of ascending and descending arpeggios. Now, this sound is slightly more complex, but when it occurs within a key center, as it was used here, the collection of tones are all diatonic to the key, and when this approach is applied, again, the listener, once more, starts to feel like they're going to be able to anticipate what that upcoming note phrase is going to sound like and what it will be, making the listener, again, feel more tuned into the piece as the passages unfold. So I want to do one more example yet with you. Uh, let's listen to one more melodic passage, but this time we're going to change the time signature, having the melody function as compound meter in 3-8 time. So 
So in that 3-8 time example, the melodic flow is still very impressionable and the way that each statement is applied makes it relatively easy for the listener to anticipate how the next upcoming melodic part will arrive in the piece. Now the main difference, however, is the rhythmic push that occurs. In this last example I played, the rhythmic push is going in that 3-8 time, you know, pushing the phrases with their accents slightly differently. The 3-8 uh, time is creating a, a different impression of where the balance of the melody flows from and this is another area that I think musicians in training unfortunately overlook. But you know, when you can go into music with a focus on the melodic flow being generated from different time signatures, it really helps you understand the rhythmic elements much better. Uh, the level of skill that you'll have with composing music is going to reach new plateaus of ability, and it's going to be something that's really fantastic for not only the composing that you're doing, but also for when you move it over to when you're improvising. Well, in wrapping things up, I just uh, want to say for the final thoughts that, uh, you know, when music uh, students are studying how to get better at applying melody and scales and using arpeggios and all that stuff, uh, musicians recognition and the control over what they perceive as good sound patterns, you know, starts hitting some pretty significant breakthrough levels as they study more. And the trick to expanding skill level uh, for the creation of melodic ideas is going to be strongly based on waveforms, you know, how you're taking in the impression of what you're doing and the sound of the, you know, visual geometric representation on the neck too, because the guitar is so visual. So uh, much like those scientists that spent long hours studying the connection between sound and the forms that were happening on uh, things like steel plates and so forth, uh, we need to establish a similar way of pursuing on our instruments uh, what happens when we use scale and arpeggio patterns, you know, to create songs. You know, those elements are really just the building blocks, but it's the music that we compose and it's the reflection of the vibrations overall that we compose that ends up determining, you know, how greatly our music is going to affect others. You know, that's kind of the power that we have as musicians, the ability to make our listeners feel a certain way when we, you know, play our songs to them. Uh, uh, the, uh, the moods that we can create, you know, we can bring them up, we can, you know, bring them down, we can make people restless, so, you know, whatever the emotional effect may possibly be for what it is we're trying to compose or what we're trying to get across when we're improvising. Well, I'd like to end the discussion by saying thanks for joining me. If you want to learn more about what I do as an online guitar teacher, then head over to my website at creativeguitarstudio.com and sign up for your free lifetime membership. When you want more, you can always upgrade to either a basic or a premium lesson package and start studying the guitar courses I've organized for the members of my website. Also, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on all this in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, hey, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch up with you next week for another episode of the Guitar Blog Insider. Hi everybody, Andrew Wasson here from creativeguitarstudio.com. I've been a professional guitarist for over 25 years now and I've been teaching guitar for even longer than that. But today I want to talk to you about your current situation by discussing the study of guitar and the time that you have available to put into it. If you're like most people, you're working a nine to five job and you're working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, that's 160 hours a month. How much free time does that leave you left over to study guitar? Uh, let's say you can maybe fit in an hour or so, uh, around four or five days in a week when you have the free time. And if that is the case, wouldn't you want to make the most of that one hour of study, practicing a highly organized, step-by-step, well-structured guitar curriculum? them. Without a structured plan, it's pretty easy to waste time. You know, a lot of times it happens by just focusing on playing through a bunch of stuff you know, you know, songs you know, riffs you already know, licks that you're familiar with. But practicing stuff you already know will not make you a better guitar player. You need a constant supply of fresh material. You know, if you practice guitar by just playing stuff you already know, before you realize it, time ticks on, time ticks by, and that valuable period of time that you have every day, it gets lost. If left alone, those hours lost every day turn into lost weeks, lost months, and then eventually lost years of wasted time. You'll still be the same guitar player that you were before because you never challenged yourself. I've seen it dozens and dozens of times in my own studio here, but you know, you can change that. In the valuable time that you do have every day, you can start studying a comprehensive guitar course that'll not only educate you, but it'll turn you into a well-skilled musician. 
So if you want to learn more, sign up for a free account through my website at creativeguitarstudio.com. The general access membership is absolutely free to join. Come in, get your feet wet, and when you're ready, you can go for the paid membership. What you'll discover in there is the most comprehensive guitar curriculum available online. I've got 25 years experience teaching guitar and have written a well-organized step-by-step guitar course. Head over to my website at creativeguitarstudio.com and sign up for a free membership today. Join the thousands of members worldwide who have already enrolled. There's no need to try learning the guitar on your own. Let me help you become the best guitar player that you can be.